What's up, Well That's Good fam? Welcome back to another Well That's Good podcast. Y'all, today I am so excited for this conversation we're going to have. But before I get to that, I just want to remind you guys that Ello Sister Conference is right around the corner, August 19th and 20th. At the end of the summer, go ahead and make your summer plans to be here in Monroe, Louisiana. Come hang out with us. We're going to worship. We're going to talk about Jesus. Why would you not get here? Go get your tickets today at ellosisterconference.com. Now, without further ado, I'm so excited for this guest. She wrote the book called Lemons on Friday. And y'all, this story is just so profound. Her name is Maddie Jackson Selectman. She is an incredible woman and she has a story to tell. She's the daughter of Alan Jackson, many of you might know. And here's some of the things her book talks about. How did I get here? Will this always hurt? Who am I now? And how do I move forward? I know many of you are probably asking some similar questions. And so let's have a conversation with Maddie. And I just so hope that this speaks to you right where you're at. Or maybe it's what a friend needs. So send it to your friends. Without further ado, welcome to the podcast, Maddie. Hey, thank you for having me. I just, I want to say I appreciate what you do and the way you use your voice tremendously. So I'm excited to get to talk with you. Oh, thank you so much. Hey, same to you. Um, just even preparing for this podcast, diving into your story, um, and not just your book, which was incredible, but also watching YouTube videos and other interviews you've done. Your faith is so inspiring. And the way that you tell your story, which we will get to, is just um, incredibly hopeful for so many people who walk through tragic situations in life. And so I just can't wait to chat. But before we get into the story and before we get into your life, let's start with the question I ask everyone on the Whoa, That's Good podcast. What is the best piece of advice that you have ever been given, Maddie? So I think it may not be the best, but it's what stuck with me the most. And when I was thinking about it, it came to mind first. So When I was graduating from college, I went to the University of Tennessee and studied creative writing, always wanted to be a writer. My dad's a songwriter. My mom wrote a book that was a New York Times bestseller. It's just, it's what I love, you know? And, And dad said to me after college, he goes, Sugar, I think you have this gift, but you need to live your life and you'll end up writing about your life. And at that point, I I don't think I understood it Um, and honestly felt like a lot of my 20s when I was doing different jobs that weren't really relevant to that, that I was kind of like wasting my time. And Mm -hmm. and then obviously with Lemons on Friday, as we as I told you before, it's not the story that I I hope that would be my first thing to write about and put out there. But I remember thinking back on that and saying, you know what, he was right. And and that, yeah. you know, means a lot to me as a writer who's just put out their first book. But also I think there's a lot that I've gleaned from it looking back, you know, that anyone can, especially early in life or like in a season of transition, because I'm such a I'm such a goal person. Mm-hmm. I'm such a to-do list and steps person yeah. that I think what it gave me permission to do is not know and just follow yeah. the way that that God leads my heart and follow where my passions are and just work hard where I am knowing that like God will weave the pieces together and not having a plan is sometimes okay. So yes, I love that. And I love how even in not having a plan, you're still working. And I think so many people think like, okay, well, eventually God's going to do this and I'll just sit back and wait. It's like, no work while you wait, you know, because normally it's what you're working on while you're waiting, that's preparing you for what's to come. And that is exactly what was happening in your story. And that is a really cool thing to know that that was something you wanted to do is to write. And that's something you're gifted in. And obviously your parents have that skill for those who don't know your dad is Alan Jackson. And I love how even when you said sugar, I was like, that's epic. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I was I like, just I know love you that. this. Like. <laughs> uh, yes, that is so epic. That's so like Southern and just great. Yeah. Um, but it's like you have this amazing gift. And so a lot of people have crazy stories that happen to them. And there's a book that they write or they co-write. That's an amazing story. But maybe, you know, the writing isn't as good, but the story is incredible, and which makes the book good. But yours is really unique because your story is very powerful, but also your writing is incredibly powerful. You can tell you're really gifted in that. And that's why I think this book is such a great read is because it's a very personal story, but it's also really well written, which... I appreciate. And so just well done. Way to do it. Way to go there. Um, Okay. So with that being said, tell me a little bit about your life. Like who is Maddie Jackson Sledgeman? How'd you grow up um, and the journey to where you are at now? 
Yeah, I mean, like you said, Alan Jackson's my dad, so I grew up in Nashville because it's where country music is, and um, grew up in that environment, which was very unique um, and very special. And I, by way of that, got to have some really cool experiences uh, in life. And I think looking back, seeing the way that you know Dad managed his career and his time, it always sort of put a little seed in my heart that I wanted to do something different. I mean, I. Yeah respect the heck out of my friends that can do business, you know, and marketing and work in offices. And, but I just always had this dream of kind of just being creative and doing different things in life. And, mm -hmm. um, as lovely as that sounds and as, uh, exciting as and that sounds to just be creative, it doesn't give you a whole lot of people trying to give you a job after college. So when I went to college, <laughs> That's said, true. I got a, an English degree, a writing degree. And, um, so in the meantime, after I graduated college, like I told you, knew I wanted to write, but needed a job, a real job. So I started working in restaurants as a lot of people do. I was 22. And, um, by way of that experience, got a lot of exposure to wine because it was a steakhouse and that's just kind of a big part of that environment and really fell in love with it. I, my parents didn't really drink wine growing up, so it's not like I had had exposure. Um, but I've always loved food and cooking and traveling and culture. And it's all that sort of wrapped up in this world of wine. And so most of my twenties were spent in the food and wine industry. And I, um, studied it and got certifications and worked for an importer and worked for a winery and just did kind of what I told you did all the things yeah. Yeah. in the industry of this, this thing that I was passionate about and ended up uh, coming back to Nashville and opening a restaurant here for a few years, which is where I was until summer of 2018. So that was mm. like four years ago. And had this restaurant here and in the midst of opening it and working like crazy 17 hours a day and, and trying to run this business, you know, as a young mid 20 something woman, um, met my husband, Ben, and, um, he is, went to Tennessee also and is from East Tennessee. And we met through mutual friend and just fell in love quickly and had a very kind of rom com -y, like romance. I mean, he's just the most charming charismatic, joyful person, you know, yeah. I, I've known and it's just very easy to fall in love with him. So you have to share, you have to share and sorry to interrupt because I heard you tell the story about how he like asked you out because I just like love the guy's confidence and persistency. Oh <laughs> like, yes, toxic confidence almost. But <laughs> um, no, but we met through a mutual friend and just at a cookout, whatever. And at that time was sort of casually dating someone else. It wasn't anything, but Anyway, I'm like walking inside to get a snack and he's on the grill and he just kind of jumps in front of me and says, you know, hey, I'm Ben, you know, I grew up with Caroline. I was like, yeah, yeah, I think we've met. And he said, I'd really love to take you out. And I was just like, wow, that's bold and surprising. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, I can't. And he's why? And I said, well, I'm kind of seeing someone else. And he, I kind of tried to go inside and he like dodged me again. And I was like, what's he doing? And he was like, well, when can I ask you again? And I was like, what? does that mean? Like I just kind of floored. And I think I just, uh, for lack of any better words said, I don't know, like a month and just sort of blew him <laughs> off. And he's like, okay. So I tell two in the book, three months later, I got a text from an eight, six, five number, which is Knoxville, which is where he's from saying, Hey Maddie, it's Ben Selectman. And, uh, I asked you out at Caroline's and you told me to give it a month. So I gave it three for good measure. So like, how about the date? And I was like, this is wild. So I text my friend Caroline. I'm like, what is this? Like, what, sh what should I do here? Mind you, he lived in Memphis. I lived in Nashville at the time. Um, and she texts back, which I love so much. She texts back. He's a great guy. He loves the Lord. He's a good time. I think you'll have fun. I don't think you'll marry the guy, but you should go. I which, don't think you'll course, marry like, the guy. was her toast at our rehearsal dinner. So it was a pretty hilarious That's story. awesome. And yeah, yeah. While I love my local post office, I don't always have time to go, especially when you get off work, you just don't want to run errands. I want to spend it with my family and my friends, and anything that saves me time is a must. That's why I use Stamps.com. My family's company, Duck Commander, also uses Stamps.com every day to ship their products, and we've also used it at LO for our merch as well. Stamps.com saves you time and money 
and stress, which makes it a no-brainer for us, and I'm sure many of you. With Stamps.com, you have access to all the post office and UPS shipping services right from your computer, plus you get discounts that you really can't find anywhere else. Using Stamps.com, you can save up to 30% off USPS rates and up to 86% off UPS. The best part is you don't have to use any special equipment to use their services. Just a regular computer and a printer, and you're up and running in minutes to print official postage for any letter, any package, anywhere that you want to send it. Stamps.com also works seamlessly with Shopify, Amazon, Etsy, eBay, and more. So whether you're sending an invoice from an office, your shipping products from your Etsy shop, or even a warehouse shipping out orders, Stamps.com is your shipping solution. So stop wasting time and start saving money when you use Stamps.com to mail and ship things. Sign up with promo code WO for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage and a digital skill. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter the code WO. That's W-H-O-A. That is so funny. Uh, it's kind of funny. My friend did the same thing for me whenever I started dating Christian. Um, she was like, no, like it is the wrong timing for you. This is not your guy kind of thing. Like, do not just date another guy. Yeah. And I was like, trust me. Like, I really think, I really think this is a good one. And then when we got, when we got engaged, she literally told Christian, she was like, sorry, I really didn't think you were the one. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. So you and Ben start dating and then y'all, eventually get married and then a couple weeks up until y'all's anniversary um uh, something really tragic happened and so you want to tell uh the listeners now a little bit about that time in your life what happened and kind of where lemons on friday the story is really coming from yeah sure so um that was let's see we got married october of 2017 and then Labor Day weekend of 2018, went on a little trip um, to Florida uh, with my two sisters and their then boyfriends and some friends. Um, a lot of them had birthdays that week. And so we were just kind of celebrating everyone. And, you know, my dad's a big fisherman. So he has a boat down there. And we just took like a really fun afternoon cruise and like ate dinner on the boat and went to this little like tiki bar and danced and had drinks and just had a nice night of it celebrating everybody. And we were all done and we were going back to get back up on the boat and Ben kind of hurried up to um, help some of the girls up onto the boat. The tide had risen. So there were big steps to get back up there and it was, it was wet and his sandal just hit it the wrong way. And he slipped and fell back and hit his head on a concrete dock. And at that point, obviously we rushed over to make sure he was okay, but it sort of, it didn't panic me too much. It kind of looked like, you know, you've watched a hundred high school football games. It happens. Mm -hmm. They get up, they shake it off yeah. and they're probably have a concussion, but they're okay. So that's sort of what we were thinking. Um, and by God's mm -hmm. grace, there were some off duty EMTs at this little place where we were, um, at the Marina and they kind of checked him out and said, you know, y'all need to go to the ER. Mm -hmm. Um, so we went and that first night, obviously very worried and disoriented, not being at home and not knowing where we are. And, and the doctors say, you know, right now he's okay. Um, his brain is starting to swell just from mm -hmm. the impact of the fall. He may have to have brain surgery. And wow. at that point, I mean, talk about shocking you back into reality. Um, but even still, they said, we don't have to do it right now. We're going to watch him overnight. So the first 24 hours we were in the hospital, he was coherent and awake and knew who I was and could kind of talk, was clearly disoriented and in pain. And then, you know, I obviously called his parents, they came down and, um, that next night they called him the middle of the night and said, Hey, we're going to have to do the surgery. We have to put him in a medically induced coma. So the total time in the hospital, he was there for 12 days, you know, multiple brain surgeries, medically induced coma the whole time. And it was just too much on his body. And the 12th mm -hmm. day, um, they called in the middle of the night and said, you know, his, his heart's failing. And mm. if y'all can get here, we can keep him alive. So wow. that was September 12th, 2018. So it was about three weeks before our first wedding anniversary. Wow. My gosh, that yeah. is, that's crazy. And I can't even imagine. And like I said before, I'm so grateful that you're even sharing this story because I know that so many people listening, something like this has happened to, you, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, tragic things happen. Um, I love how you said one time you said people slip and fall. And yeah. how do you feel like 
having that perspective of what happened um, has helped get you through because I feel like it's in those moments that you start to go down like all the why questions like why mm, did this happen totally. like like what can we have done different and maybe you wrestle through that maybe talk about some of the wrestle through those questions and getting to the point where you realize that life does happen and stuff yeah. like that how have you like come to cope with that being that yeah. I mean, I think that's what's so hard is that you, everyone knows, right. That another day isn't guaranteed. Like we know that right. in our head, but then when something as simple and seemingly, you know, unharmful as a slip and a fall mm-hmm. ends up in a tragedy like that, it does make you question. It makes you question, you know, what could we have done differently that night? Like what, could they have done differently in the hospital? Like, did I give them enough information? And what, where was God? I mean, you go from like these literal yeah. practical questions to these huge questions of faith. Right. And that's really what the Lemons on Friday is. You know, mm-hmm. when when he died, I didn't, I've never experienced anything tragic until this. I had no idea how to manage grief. I had no idea what it was going to feel like. Wow. I had no idea really how to hurt well, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. And all I know to do at that point was be honest about those questions. And I did that yeah. in a journal because I I didn't even quite know how to voice them to myself, yeah. much less other people. And that was where I really kind of went went to battle and went rounds with God is, is why us? Like, yeah. I mean, you and Christian are such an incredible example. And like Ben and I truly prayed, like use our marriage for the good of your kingdom. Like that's what marriages mm-hmm. are. And so when he let this go so quickly, I, I, I just couldn't understand yeah. why he could allow it. And, and I will say, this is not like a pastor approved theological answer, but what I know in my soul from my time with the Lord and the spirit um, he didn't cause that to happen. I don't believe he causes us to suffer. He hates death. That's very clear in scripture. But if you believe in a God who is good and a God who is sovereign, I had to accept that he allowed it. Mm-hmm. And that was the biggest thing to grapple with is wow. if you're in control and you could have stopped this or you could have healed him in the hospital, like we play, prayed for miraculous healing. And that didn't happen for us. Um, how do I accept that you're still good and you're still sovereign, but you didn't choose to intervene for me. And I think that's the struggle as believers in the world is people slip, bad things happen, mass shootings happen. I mean, this has been a really, really hard couple years for the world. Right. And how do we pacify that? And I think the, the only answer that I know how to give is where I arrived. And that was at a certain point, I kind of felt the Lord say like, if I gave you these answers, what would it change? And it made me think, okay, if I got a handwritten apology, you know, postmarked heaven, here's why, here's what happened. Here's all the good that's going to you know, come from it. It still wouldn't have helped me in that moment because my heart was still broken. My husband was still gone and I had to still continue to learn how to live. And so at that point it sort of went from, okay, I have to lay down and surrender this very human desire to understand and to get the mm-hmm. wise answered because yeah. when I lay that down, I can choose trust over understanding. And that's the that's only good. way I'm going to be free from this. Wow. I'm like, I'm like so already blown away. And I'm like, everyone just stop and go back and listen to everything you just said again. And that's what I felt like in your book. That's what I felt like every interview that I've watched from you. It's like when you speak, you speak with such ease and so much power comes out and you can tell it's from your prayer life. You can tell it's from those moments wrestling with God. And I love how you take the time to wrestle with God. I think so many people are like either almost like falsely naive to things or like don't want to talk about the bad because they're like, oh, God's good. God's good. And like, I'm not even going to like go there with the bad. But then like you also have to understand and you also have to acknowledge that things are bad and things do hurt and like life right. does happen. Um, but it's like wrestling through how are you still good in all that and yeah. coming to the point that you are sovereign and you do have a plan that we can't see and it's greater than this time that we have on earth because it goes to eternity and just wrestling that out. And I think some people don't want to ask those questions. You talk mm-hmm. a little bit about like, the tendency to want to numb the pain and like distract yourself from it and really go in there with it. Um, especially right after the funeral, you talk about like, okay, what now? Um, I'm sure the, the thing you want to do is just not even think about it, avoid it, but you like dove straight into it. And so talk about just diving into those things, like wrestling with God, diving into the things, feeling the hurt in order to move forward. 
Yeah, I appreciate that question and everything you said, because I think that there's a tendency, and I, I won't speak for everyone, but I think when you grow up, um, especially in the church like we did, there is some sort of thought that we internalize as a kid that's like, okay, if we believe God is good, like everything should be fine. Like, yes, yeah. I, I do believe there is a reason for everything, but I think that that shouldn't be like a reason that you can't hurt. You know, it's mm-hmm. like I said, when I started this process with the book, I told the my editors, I said, the last thing I want to do is put a scripture bandaid on something that is a gaping wound. Like you can't wow. do that. You know, like, wow. and it's a part of it. And and my faith was what buoyed me through the darkest days when mm. I dove in. And so I think that, you know, it, we feel valiant when we act tough and especially when we use our faith as armor, which it is, I mean, it is the yeah. armor of God, but I think that they're the only way to healthily live and grieve and hurt and heal and like navigate this life. I talk about the fact that like God made us with two hands, one to hold on to his promises that everything will be redeemed. Like my heart will be healed. He will give me new life here in eternity. But in the other hand, man, you got to be honest about how broken you are, you know, like, and if you look at the people in scripture, they don't sugarcoat stuff. Like they go through really, really hard things. I mean, like Paul literally says, I wanted to end my life. And I think that we, we cheapen our faith when we don't invite God into the really, really hard parts. Like he wants to be in our joy, but man, look at Jesus. Like he came in to hang with the sick people and the outcast people and brokenhearted people. And like, I just think about human relationships, right? When you go through something really hard with someone, if you do it well and do it together, like it enriches your relationship in a way that, you know, easy peasy seasons don't. And that's what I would tell people is like, you being upset with God, you grappling with God, you questioning God, if it's with the intention not to walk away from him, but with the intention to really say, I got to hear from you on this. Like th- yeah. these points are connecting for me and I need your help. When you yeah. do the struggle with him, your relationship with him enriches too, just like it does That's with great. people. And so like your doubt is not, it is not undermining your faith. It can really enrich it when you so continue true. to sort of battle with him. Y'all know one of my favorite snacks is cereal. I mean, what is not to love? It can be breakfast or dessert. I give you the ultimate food. I love it for a midnight snack if I'm working late or up with honey, but it's also the easiest start to my day too. However, I know I need to eat something that's probably going to be a little healthier and sustain my energy instead of making it crash later, and that's why I love Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon has 0 grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only 4 net grams of carbs in each serving. The honey nut flavor which is so delicious they had to bring it back, has one gram of sugar, and each serving of Magic Spoon only has 140 calories. Plus, if you have any dieting restrictions, don't worry, because Magic Spoon is also keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb, and that makes it guilt-free. hey You can also build your custom box by choosing out from their nine available flavors like cocoa, frosted, fruity, peanut butter, cookies and cream, maple waffle, blueberry muffin, cinnamon roll, and honey nut. The next box comes in this week, and I'm so excited, especially for Honey Nut, because it's our favorite. I mean, hey, its name is Honey. We kind of have a thing for that. Plus, I added some Magic Spoon cereal bars that are so popular that they brought them back permanently, and it's a perfect on-the-go snack. With Magic Spoon, you get to indulge without sacrificing your health, so don't miss out. Go to magicspoon.com slash woe to grab a custom bundle of cereal, and be sure to use our promo code at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that it's back with a 100% happiness guarantee. So for any reason you don't like it, they'll refund your money back, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash woe and use my code woe to save $5 off at checkout. So true. That's so good and such good encouragement because when people sitting there in that moment of grief and they have all these thoughts and they don't give themselves the grace to get them out or the space to do that. Like I think that's when yeah. people grow like truly bitter and can't yeah. move on or 
you never, I guess, move on, but move forward, you know? Right. Um, those type of things. Um, I love how you shared that. It was almost like God was preparing Ben in, in this little way uh, for y'all's anniversary to come. Um, and this story, that, that part of the story was so crazy to me. And I was just like, wow. And just so you know, for the listeners, I am saying some parts of the book, but there is so much more than everything we're going to talk <laughs> about. So like, you have to get the book. But there's this part where it's just like, whoa, God really went before And not that this makes everything better, not that this even makes everything easier. In some sense, it was probably really hard, but at the same time, it was really sweet. And so Mm -hmm. talk about y'all's anniversary, your first anniversary when he had just passed. Yeah. So one thing that people ask me or or have very often is like, what do you like, what do you know about God or what did you learn about God in this process? And my answer is that he's so personal and he's so Mm. tender. And this story is part of what taught me that. And so, like I said, three weeks before our first anniversary is when he passed away. So I'm approaching that day and obviously have no idea how to handle it, have no idea how I'm going to feel. Obviously, tons of anxiety, tons of just sorrow and frustration and just everything that you would feel. And so going into it, I knew... I knew it was going to be brutal. Hmm. I also knew that I needed to plan something to try to celebrate, which sounds crazy, but I'm like, this is the day that I should be celebrating with him. And if he could look down and phone me uh, from heaven, he would be like, you need to celebrate. Like, this is what we would be doing. So I did the best I could to plan a little dinner with like my girlfriends and his mom and my family and da 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 but then i woke up that morning and th- nothing in me wanted to celebrate of, of course, course yeah and, but there was a little part of me that thought if i don't if i don't deal with this if i do what maddie's default mode is which is to push forward and push my feelings down and try to just stay strong and be okay i'm going to i can't do that like that's not going to work for me and i won't be able to enjoy a moment of this evening which i might right. be able to you know if right. i really take time to sit still with how terrible this is right so i stayed at home that morning and honestly all i wanted to do was see him like all i wanted mm-hmm. to do was see him and his infectious joy and his smile and so i watched our wedding video every moment of it i mm-hmm held this beautiful gift from him that I had found um, and just sobbed. I just sobbed harder than I had sobbed except for the moment I told him goodbye. And how I know how tender and sweet God is and how personal and intimate he is in our lives is that what the gift was, uh, our anniversary was in October, and before he passed in, I think, July, we got a, a package from Etsy. And I had gone downstairs where he had his little office, and I said, what is this from Etsy? And he was like, don't open it. And I said, why? And he said, well, it's it's for our anniversary. And I just thought of it in advance. And like, I really don't want you to open it till then. And I was like, okay, well, that's shocking. Like men don't plan that far in advance. <laughs> no so way. I left it alone. Didn't think about it again. Found it when I came home from Florida right after he had died and really debated opening it. But I just felt like this was such a God wink. And it was such a way yeah. to honor, you know, something that Ben had asked me to do. So I waited till that morning and I opened it. And it was a uh, bouquet of paper roses, um, which is paper's the first anniversary. And it was made of hymnal pages. And the fact that the fact that Ben had the forethought to gift this to me in this special way, I mean, hymnal pages, it's so cool. And the fact that God prompted him and God knew that I would need that, you know, like Ben probably didn't have any, I don't think there was like a direct line, like, Hey, you're going to go get her uh, roses made of hymnal pages. Right, right. It's just so specific and so tender and so kind. And I kind of just knew in that moment, like, like, God, you're really not going to leave me in this. Like you're wow. really in every tear and like every breakdown in every moment. And it was mm-hmm. just beautiful and heartbreaking <laughs> and tragic all at the same time. But I think that, Dang. yeah, he's, he's in it. He's in that the little That is window. so powerful. It makes yeah. me think of that verse that talks about even though the grass withers and fades, the word of God will remain. And, you know, most anniversary gifts have to do with flowers. And it would be a flower that would 
die. It would wither and would fade. But what he gave you was the eternal word that lasts forever in the shape of roses. Like, yeah. it's just so cool. Like, that's the thing that you'll be able to hold on to forever. And what a symbolic thing, even yeah. just with that word. So that is just so cool. Um, one thing I love is that your plan on your anniversary was going to be with your family and your friends and your people which I'm sure it's hard to invite people into that moment, or maybe maybe you need people in that moment. And I think these are the questions that sometimes I have a hard time like asking people who have gone through something tragic. So I'm just going to ask you, since you are like so great at talking about some of these things, like for people who are not the person who went through the tragic thing, how do you love someone well in that mm-hmm. moment? Is it asking the questions? Is it not? Is it showing up? Is it listening? Is it speaking? Because I think sometimes people, like I remember even when my great grandpa died and I like started avoiding my great grandma because I just didn't know how to handle that. And I remember all she wanted was me to show up, you know, but that was hard for me because it felt awkward. I didn't know what to say. I didn't want to say the wrong thing. And so for you, what were some of the ways that your community came around you that was very helpful for those listening who are like, I want to help, but I don't want to say too much. I don't want to hurt the problem even worse. Yeah, sure. I think I, I appreciate so much that people felt tender enough to worry, honestly. So I hope that people here like don't feel bad that you don't know what to do or don't feel bad that you feel nervous. I think that's you having a tender heart toward whoever's right, hurting. Right. Um, for me, I mean, and everyone needs different things. I'll say that. And even as someone who was grieving and had a great community, I needed different things on different days, different things at different moments. And so I think exactly what you said is what I've told people is that at the end of the day, especially if you lose someone very close to you, who's in a daily part of your life, like, I just didn't want to be alone. And I wanted to feel as normal as I could because I Mm. felt the least, like the least normal human on the planet. I felt Mm. like no one who's 28 has experienced this. Nobody can ever understand what I'm going through. And I feel like Mm. I'm just going to be this black sheep like forever. And so there were, what I needed was actual just presence. And honestly, I don't think the words even matter. Like I couldn't tell you what any of my friends said to me for the most part. But they were there and, you know, genuinely asked. I think this is powerful. Rather than trying to guess, what I loved is people would say, hey, do you want to talk about Ben? Or do you want me to tell you everything that's going on in my life? Like why my job is a nightmare, why my (laughs) husband is irritating, what my children are stuffing up their nose, like what I've been watching on Netflix. Because there was a moment where I really would want to get lost in somebody else's life because that felt normal for them. Yeah. But there were some days where I really wanted to talk about him and maybe I wanted to cry about him or maybe I wanted to like tell a funny story and laugh. And the fact that they simply said, hey, well, number one, do you want to talk at all or do you just want to hang? Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about Ben or do you want me to talk about my life and kind of get lost in it for a second? And I I thought that was so powerful and so kind and simple. Listen, friends, it is no secret if you've been around long enough that I love Liberty University. There are so many things I can rave about. My experience with their online classes was great. My siblings, Bella, John Luke, and Will, and one of my newest team members just graduated from Liberty. But even more than that, I just believe in their mission. At Liberty, their mission is training champions for Christ. That's the one statement that shapes the way that you do education because while you're learning, you're also growing spiritually. This year, Liberty is celebrating their 50th anniversary, which, first of all, Wow, what a legacy that is. All because one man had a vision to establish a university that would impact thousands of lives for Jesus. Since their first year in 1971, Liberty has been a campus of answered prayers and miracles. Starting with 154 students, it's now expanded to over 250,000 alumni serving around the globe with more than 125,000 studying on campus and online. Taking online classes was so nice for me because there was no set login time, so I could just work around my schedule and I'm a night owl so I learn and work best between like 10 and 12 okay at night at Liberty University there's more than 450 online degrees from associate to doctorate level and most classes are 100% online with my hectic schedule I could attest to how nice it was to take classes online and your professors are so kind mine certainly were and I was actually learning New Testament and Old Testament which was great for me and I felt like I learned so much about it from someone who reads the Bible a lot 
lot. It was really cool to learn more about it from the classes that I took. So it's just a great school. And even with all these perks, tuition rates are in the bottom third of leading online universities, which is pretty awesome. Liberty offers multiple scholarships and discounts to help you achieve your dreams at a price that you can actually afford, all while learning from skilled professors and forming relationships with other students around the globe. So to start your future now, go to liberty.edu slash Sadie. And because you're a Whoa That's Good listener, you'll also get your application fee waived. So friends, don't wait. Go to liberty.edu slash Sadie now and get your future started today. I love that. That's such great advice. Just ask. Like, yeah. that's the thing. I think so many times we think we have to have all the answers, but a lot of times asking the question is the best way to go. Yeah. And yeah. I love that. About It's really cool to, like, have the understanding that in those moments you just feel like anything but normal, and sometimes you just want to, like – it's like <sighs> it's like whenever life's stressful, and sometimes you're like, let me just get lost in someone else's drama so you watch Grey's Anatomy or something I like mean, that. I mean, like, like, there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, like, let me just see someone else's yeah. situation. No, yeah. I – I totally get that. Um, one thing I, I've been so excited to ask you about this because I love God dreams. Like God dreams mm-hmm. are the craziest thing. I've had a couple here and there that I've just been um, really honestly powerful moments in my life that might have even shifted life in a different way just from a dream I've had. And you shared this story about a dream that you had right before Christmas that was just honestly wild. wild. And so like honestly wild. Yeah. And so can you tell us about the dream that you had and then unpacking just some of the things that the revelation that God gave you following that dream? Yeah. Uh, so it's pretty long. So I'll try to give you like a little bit of the cliff notes. It's version, okay. But... We have time. Okay, cool. So the, way, the reason that this sort of dream thing came about at all is that many, many people after Ben passed, I mean, very soon after he passed in the first month or two that were a part of our lives, kept calling or texting me and saying again, to circle back, I had a dream about Ben. I don't know if you want to hear it or not. And I always wow. wanted to hear it. So I would ask. And every dream was like perfectly tailored to the person and their relationship to him. And the message always was in some different way, like he's, he's at home with the Lord. Like he's, he's living it up in heaven. Like that was the message. And so I kept praying. I was like, God, like I, I deserve one of these is honestly (laughs) what I prayed. I was like, I need this, like not to confirm that he's there because I know that beyond a shadow of a doubt, but I just, my heart's broken. Like I would give anything for him to come back and I need to see that he's so overjoyed that he wouldn't come back if he could, you know, like that's what my heart needs. And I prayed that for several months and honestly felt really frustrated that I wasn't getting anything. Um, And it was three days before Christmas, uh, about three months after he died. And I was at my parents' farm, which is right outside of Nashville. And so I was in a room with my sister and packed a little overnight bag and woke up at like 5 a.m. It's still dark. And had this insane dream, like jumped up, was like, I can't wake her up, but I got to write this down. And so I grabbed like a flannel out of my bag, put it on, go downstairs to like write all this down. And what the dream was, was basically my own little trip to heaven. And so I got up there somehow and it started out, you know, with this little sort of outdoor shopping market, which I don't really know the relevance of that, but he was there like interacting with all the shop people and like talking to some of the other customers and like clearly had friends. And I was just like in shock watching him because he was fine. And then I saw his dad across the way and he ran up and, you know, his dad always called him Ben Tonius. And he ran up and gave him this huge bear hug and said, Tonius. And they had a minute and then he saw me and came over and I was just like, please don't leave me. Please don't leave me. And he said, I'm not going anywhere. And we like shopped and he was picking out, he he turned around and pulled up this flannel that was like red and black, just like one he had in real life. And he was like, should I get it? And I was like, no, you already have one. And he looked kind of disappointed. And then we went on. And so he, well, no, he put it on. And so then we, we walk around and it's literally just us going through what would be his version of heaven. I mean, it was outdoors, animals everywhere, rolling hills. He was a big outdoorsman and hunter. And, um, we even saw, there was one point we saw seven little turkeys go by, which was another crazy God wink that had happened to me in real life. We saw doves overhead, which is obviously like presence of the Holy spirit. And then we saw this pack of little tiny baby yellow labs, just like the one we had got two months ago. It like had her collar on and he picked her up and like showed her to this man who was next to him and said, this one's my girl. 
And so I, that's when I looked up there and I was like, who is this man? You couldn't really see his face, but he was so peaceful and so strong. And you could tell they were like best friends. Wow. And then it hit me that it was Jesus. So he was standing up here with Jesus on this hill. And it was like, he was showing me where our life on earth and his life in heaven were intersecting. And it was just crazy. So wow. the, the, the real like finale of it was that, and like Jesus kind of disappeared. And then Ben started to walk toward me and I was begging him again, like, please don't leave me. Please don't leave me. And he was like, I have to go, but you will be okay. Like you will be okay. And I was like, no, you can't. And he said, like, grab my hands again and said, you will be okay. And at that point he turned to walk away and I saw all these lash lashes on his back and they were, they weren't fresh. Like they weren't bloody. I mean, that's kind of gross, but they looked like scars that had healed. And I ran up to him and I was like, Oh my gosh, are you okay? What happened? And he turned back and looked at me and said, Maddie, it is the coolest story, but I know you already know it. And wow. then he turned and walked away and I woke up wow. and Part of why that was so powerful. All the other little things were crazy. Like no joke, that flannel that I grabbed out of my bag in the dark that I put on was the exact one that was in the dream. I had that gotten it out of his insane. closet. Insane. Crazy. The dog, our dog with the same collar, all of that, just wild. Um, but <laughs> wild. the lashes, I remember being in the hospital um, that whole week. And I keep praying for a miracle, praying for a miracle. And then at the very end, you know, they pulled him off life support and we were there. And by some miracle, I looked down and realized like he had all these holes in his hand from all the IVs and he had literal X's on his feet from where they had trying to be circulating his blood. And he literally looked like he had a crown of thorns all the way around his head because he had st staples all the way around wow. his head. And looking down and feeling like this is how God sees him. Like God sees him wow. with every scar that Jesus took on his behalf. Like he is wow. literally covered by Christ and he is going wow. to be with them. And so the dream ending like that was just God's confirmation of what you saw at his bedside was true. And the only thing I couldn't see with him laying in a hospital bed was his back. And so when he walked away, it was like, he's got these scars too. Like he is 100% covered in Christ and you can, you can let him go. Like you can let him go. Wow. Oh my gosh. That is like it's the wild. craziest. It's yeah. wild. And it's just yeah. so cool because there's just confirmation after confirmation, like the seven turkeys, like you said, yeah. the doves, yeah. the lab, then Jesus. And I love how you said like he was so strong and so peaceful and mm -hmm. like, it's just amazing. But when you said that about having holes in his hands and the X on his feet and the crown of thorns and even um, the the tube in his side. I think. You oh yeah, I forgot that one. Tube yeah. In his side, I was like, oh my word, God yeah. literally gave you a picture of Christ, and yeah. that is like just incredible. I love how you mentioned after that 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 dream, although powerful and wild and mm -hmm. crazy, didn't make all the pain go away. You know. And I think some people, you know, have these God dreams and they're amazing. Uh, but then, so, but then you, you still feel the pain or some, or some people haven't had that yet. And they're sitting in the silence of it and you still feel the pain. Um, you talk about paper cuts kind of being a way you describe the pain sometimes as you're walking through. And so just for the person specifically walking through grief right now, who is wrestling with that, like they've had moments where they've seen mm -hmm. the purpose or they've had moments where they've seen God. Or maybe they have it and they're sitting here and they're like, I just don't. I'm just sitting in the pain. I'm feeling the paper cuts. I'm getting it. Um, just from a sister who understands, you just want to take a moment to just directly encourage the person who's listening um, and just the story that she's in because I just feel like there's so many people – who probably a friend sent them this podcast and are like, you have to hear this. This girl has been through something similar. We just speak to that person just for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. I would say for the person waiting, if you haven't had, if you're, if you feel like God's silent, like number one, he's not, but keep asking, keep That's asking, good. keep asking for what your heart needs. It's not silly. It's, it's what he wants from us. Like say to you're a mom, what do you want more than, what do you wait more than when your daughter can talk to you and say, mom, I need this from you. And you want to yeah. give it to her. Like yeah. he wants to give you those dreams and those affirmations because he's a good father. So keep asking, keep asking. And if you have had them and then like me, you fall right back into the everyday pains because that's what grief is. Um, 
I call them paper cuts in the book because it feels like I remember thinking everything was a trigger. Like everywhere I would look, every song I would hear, everything I would see would remind me of him and would hurt. And it would really, I kept being frustrated. Like why does seeing halo oranges in the grocery store Hmm. make me cry? Like, yeah, I, and I, I remember feeling these like these are never going to stop. Like I'm going to live in a constant world where everything is sad and things that used to make me happy are always going to make me cry. And that is mm-hmm. how it feels at the beginning. And I would say honor that. Don't mm-hmm. act like it's, you know, don't act like you're weak because little things trigger you. Share them with people if that makes you feel better. Write them down if that makes it, you feel better. Try to figure out how you can feel it and let it out and then take another step forward. Mm -hmm. But my encouragement would be like those paper cuts soften, you know, they really do. They they don't go away. Um, but they don't cut as deeply with time and with faith and with real work to acknowledge them and honor them because Mm -hmm. they, the the little things that, that will always remind you of the person you've lost or the, or the little things that remind you of what you're praying so hard for and maybe waiting for that you don't have yet. Like maybe, you're waiting for marriage. Maybe you're waiting for a baby. And every time you get an invitation, it, it cuts you and yeah. that's okay. And it, it will, God will help you endure those. And they honestly will help in your healing when you, when you take the time to respect how painful they are. It's okay. Yeah. That's so good. Just giving people permission to honor and respect that because that yeah. is real. Like I said, there's just this tendency to like, sometimes act like it's all okay and just, you know, bury that emotion, bury that thing. Yeah. And I just heard this sermon the other day and it was so good. And it was talking about how Jesus felt every emotion fully and never sinned. And I was like, wow, Lord. like that is so powerful to think about that you can fully feel angry and you can fully feel sad and you can fully feel all those things. And that doesn't mean that's a bad thing. You know, like yeah. Jesus wept over the death yeah. of his friend. He felt angry over the unjust things. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, he still remained in relationship with the Father. And yeah. so, yeah, honor those things, feel those things, have those moments. And that doesn't make you weak. That's actually yeah. part of making you strong. And so, friend, I'm so glad to even just know you now. And I'm so grateful that you wrote this book. Again, for those listening, it's Lemons on Friday. You can get it, I'm sure, anywhere books are sold. Is that right? Yep. Anywhere books are sold. And also, I just want to say, you said this at the beginning, that Christian and I have been such a good influence, and you and Ben had those dreams of that. And I just want to say y'all are that. You know, um, I know you have new relationships now. You, you have a new thing. You're doing stuff. But at the same time, like, y'all have done that. And I, yeah. I did actually go online and watch y'all's wedding video, and it was so sweet and so cute. And he was just larger than life and yeah. looked like so much joy and a good time. And some of the things y'all said y'all had planned to do, I know it wasn't what you thought. It wasn't what y'all had planned, but y'all have begin and will continue to touch the world with the relationship that y'all had and the faith that you have. And so thank you for diving in, for wrestling with God and for putting out incredible words to process and help people process the grief that they're going through. Hugely encouraging and just a whoa, that's good book. So thanks for being on the podcast. (laughs) Thank you, Sadie, for all of that. I just, I really appreciate it. And I just tell people like, hold on to hope, just never let go of it. Feel everything else, but hold on to hope. It's great. That's so good. Well, thank you, friend. I hope we get to meet in person because you're awesome. Yes. And God bless everyone who's listening. Go get the book right now. Read the words and respect all the feels.